Well, again, what a delight it is to be with you here this morning, and so thank you, Pastor Phil, um, for allowing me to be part of this important series from the book of Jonah. I need to begin with a confession. I hadn't read Jonah for a long, long time. (laughs) I mean, I know the story, right? (laughs) But I hadn't read the actual text for a long, long time when Pastor Phil said, would you please preach from Jonah chapter 2? So, the first thing I did, (laughs) I opened my Bible and I read the book of Jonah, and I read straight through, you know, chapter 1, Jonah running from God, the storm, getting thrown into the sea, swallowed by a fish, a whale, no, a fish, Um, then chapter 2, a long prayer, chapter 3, Jonah preaches to Nivea, they repent, chapter 4, Jonah is miffed. He sits under a tree, gets into an argument with God, and then I turned the page, (laughs) looking for chapter (laughs) 5. I went to seminary for three years. (laughs) My final for my Hebrew class was to translate the book of Jonah from Hebrew into English, you know, 30 plus years ago, but still, (laughs) I was looking for chapter 5. I really was. Chapter 4 ends with God's penetrating question to Jonah, and I automatically assumed there was a chapter 5. You know, Jonah's answer to God, the, the one where he grows up in his faith, realizes that God's mercy is for everyone and then ends up celebrating the repentance of an evil city that turned to God. (laughs) But there wasn't a chapter 5 in my Bible. There never was. (laughs) So all of this is simply to say that if you are someone like me who has been content to think very little of the story of Jonah, (laughs) you're not alone. But, but I hope you are reading Jonah now. You can do it in 10, 15 minutes. Reading Jonah now because Pastor Phil is right. Not only is this a powerful lesson for Christian disciples, it is very timely for a world caught up in paralyzing or in, in polarizing hatreds. So, chapter 2 the book of Jonah. If you brought your Bible, go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in front of, I think, most of you in the hymnal rack there in front of you, and Jonah will be found on page 1442. It will really be helpful for you to be looking at the text as we talk this morning. So try to find a Bible and open up to Jonah chapter 2, and let's look at the text. What do, we, what do we have here? I mean, does this prayer remind you of anything elsewhere in Scripture? The, the form, the imagery? I mean, this looks like a psalm, right? So much like a psalm that we could probably cut and paste any of a dozen psalms into this spot and hardly notice. I mean, like Psalm 88. So this prayer is a psalm, a a, a literary form, long cherished by God's people, carefully crafted and directed toward God, useful for worship and in public and in private. This is a style of writing that would have been expected 
in a prayer by Jonah's readers. This was the kind of prayer they valued. <laughs> now, <laughs> we would expect a very different kind of prayer uh, from someone who was on the verge of drowning and then, and then swallowed by a great fish. Uh, because we value spontaneity and, and immediacy in prayer. I mean, something like, Help! <laughs> oh God, if you get me out of this fish, I'll go to Nineveh. I'll tell them anything you want me. Just get me out of here. But Jonah prays a psalm. And whether they're located in the book of Psalms or anywhere uh, throughout other books of Scripture, psalms are terribly important to us in at least this way. They teach us how to pray. So, <laughs> have you ever felt like you were on the verge of drowning? Like Jonah? So overwhelmed by forces outside of your control that you were on the verge of being overcome? Now, may, <laughs> maybe some of you are feeling that way this morning, right here, right now. I hope not. But life is such that in any group of people this size, the chances are that some, maybe many, are experiencing waves of trouble just like Jonah's storm. And psalms are God-given prayers for people just like you and me. Psalms give us language to pour out our deepest feelings before God. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the pain, whatever the anger, God gives us language to express exactly what we are experiencing. So listen to, to Jonah, verse 3. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Verses 5 and 6. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. So I, I felt like that. And I know you have too. And it, it gives me comfort to know that God has shown me how to pray when I feel like that. Name it. Name it. Tell him exactly how it feels. Mince no words. And if you can't come up with words, satisfying words, then pray a psalm like Jonah's or one in the book of Psalms. Find a psalm to express it for you. Let the psalms teach you to pray. Now, psalms typically come in two forms. Psalms of thanksgiving and psalms of lament. Interestingly, up to 70% of the Bible's psalms are psalms of lament. They lay it out before God. All of the, the rawness of life, the misery, the anger, the, the frustration, the wounded emotions that follow human beings throughout the centuries. God gives us language to express it all. And again, if, if you're so overcome that you're unable to pray, pray a psalm. They're God's gifts to us. Now, for Jonah, life went from bad to worse. <laughs> from, from drowning in wild torrents to bleaching out in the belly of a fish. For all he knew, at this moment, for all he knew, this was how he would die. I mean, no wonder he laments, right? But curiously... This is a psalm of thanksgiving. Not 
not a lament. Hope, not despair. Look at verse 2. I called for help and you listened to my cry. Remember, he's still in the fish's belly. I called for help and you listened to my cry. Verse 4, I said, I have been banished from your sight and yet I will look again to your holy temple. Every time despair is voiced, it's answered by words of certainty that God will rescue. Verse 6, But you, Lord my God, you brought me my life up from the pit. And then verse 7, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. See, this is the prayer of a mature disciple. One who knows that God has the last word in any kind of trouble. One who trusts God, even in the midst of, of soul-sucking trouble. Salvation comes from the Lord. Well, the author tells us that, that Jonah prayed this prayer, and then, verse 10, the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So it turns out, that the great fish was actually the means through which God rescued Jonah from the terrifying storm. So, I mean, Jonah's prayer has much to offer us in our own times of trouble. But it, its placement in the story is curious, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the prayer, we see that what we've come to expect from God-inspired psalms, a resolution to the trouble that comes from putting our trust in Him and Him alone. Very mature discipleship. But then look at Jonah in chapter 3 and in chapter 4. I mean, sure, Jonah goes to Nivea and he preaches just like God commanded, but his attitude is anything but that of a mature disciple. He's peeved. He sulks. He says he'd rather be dead. (laughs) Why? Well, because Nineveh repented. Because God relented his judgment. Because Jonah didn't get to see the sons of guns destroyed like they deserved. Eugene Peterson puts it like this. He says, Jonah is worse obedient than he was disobedient. (laughs) In his disobedience, at least he had compassion for the sailors on the ship. In his obedience, he has only contempt for the citizens of Nineveh. (laughs) And then chapter 4 ends with God's penetrating question, should I not have Compassion on Nineveh, 120,000 people, and also their cows. But there is no chapter 5, no humbled Jonah who sees and corrects his great error, his utter lack of compassion for people that God loves. So why... (laughs) Why do we see great maturity in Jonah in this prayer, but nowhere else in the story? Shouldn't this prayer have been placed at the end of the story, where a chastened Jonah comes around? Why did the author place it in chapter 2, the middle of a story that seems to have no satisfying end? (laughs) That's a puzzle for us. Now, there are two two theories. One theory says that this is the prayer Jonah should have prayed, but didn't. He should have recognized the storm as God's means of humbling him, of breaking his arrogant resistance, placing him in a position where he couldn't continue running from God 
a place where he had nowhere else to turn but to God. Unfortunately, some of us need that from time to time, don't we? I mean, last week, Pastor Phil called it a severe mercy from God, a storm in our lives that removes all pretense of our spirit-killing self-sufficiency and places us in a position where we either pray to God or we die. But there is, however, no evidence anywhere in Jonah's story that he's willing to pray at all. All of the other characters, the, the pagan sailors on the, on the ship, and even the wicked inhabitants of Nineveh, all of the other characters in this story eventually pray to the living God. But, when, but Jonah refuses to pray even when the captain of a sinking ship implores him to pray to his God. See, Jonah should have prayed this prayer, the theory goes. Then, God's gracious response, his rescue, would have transformed him. Transformed him into someone who would be gracious to others. Even the people of Nineveh. <laughs> That's what God's grace does to us, right? Right? That's what God's grace does to us when we finally grasp just how wide and deep God's grace is to undeserving rebels like us. It transforms us. I mean, how can we be contemptuous of others when we ourselves have received so much grace? But, obviously, the theory goes, he didn't pray this prayer because even though God rescued him, he went to Nineveh as the same old Jonah. Jonah obedient, worse than Jonah disobedient. Now, the other theory is that this is a prayer of reflection. This is our narrator inserting a prayer into Jonah's story after the whole episode is over, after God's compassion for Nineveh and his penetrating question has set Jonah, with, set with him for a while and caused him to reflect. Ah, now I get it. Now I see the error in my thinking about God and about Nineveh. In other words, this is the chapter 5 I was looking for. Now, I can't tell you which theory is correct. Um, either way, though, this story about Jonah becomes a story for us. An open-ended story for us. We are Jonah now. Who are we going to be? The Jonah of chapters 1, 3, and 4? Running from God, angry, pouting, contemptuous, worse obedient than disobedient? Or the Jonah of this prayer, a mature disciple turning wholly to God, leaving our pretense of, of control behind, allowing God's infinite grace to transform us into people who extend that grace to others no matter how contemptible they may have seemed to us. Which Jonah? Now, there's a key feature of this prayer that we haven't looked at yet. The key feature, I believe. Verses 8 and 9. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Uh, some English translations say, turn away from God's grace for them. And some say, forfeit the mercy that was theirs. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the mercy that was theirs. 
oh my, (laughs) to forfeit the love and mercy of God that is ours? Of course, we're not talking about salvation here, but the love and mercy of God in our lives that was ours. So keep that awful possibility in the back of your minds as as we go on. Verse 9, But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. So, So, who is this prayer addressing when it says those who turn to worthless idols. Who is this prayer addressing? Is, it, is Jonah talking to the pagan sailors on the ship that he put in peril? Is he talking to the ruthless barbarians of Nineveh? Is he talking to people kind of out there? Who is Jonah speaking to? And how did idols get into this prayer? Well, to begin to answer, let me ask this. How often do you think about idols? I mean, how often, you know, outside the occasional Sunday morning sermon, how often does the subject of idols enter your minds? How often does it come up in conversation with other believers? Never. <laughs> I mean, is that pretty close? Never? (laughs) We know, don't we, that this is not just an ancient problem with temples and shrines and household gods. Anything in the created world that takes the place of God in our lives is an idol. Anything we look to for what can only come from God Himself is an idol. And once we frame it that way, well, we know that idols are everywhere in modern life. And perhaps a worse problem for us than they were for the ancient Hebrews. (laughs) Who or what are you entrusting your life to? Pastor Phil asked us that last week. The living God or idols? Money, sex, power, computers and technology, dream homes and travel, pop stars, politicians, politics, social media, sports. (laughs) I mean, you, you could make as good a list as I can. Anything can become an idol if we look to it instead of God to give our lives identity, meaning, comfort, purpose, security. Idols are everywhere, aren't they? And today's idols are just as dangerous as they always have been because they give the illusion that we don't need God to live meaningful, successful, fulfilling lives. Idols never provide what they promise, not in the long run. They always let us down in the end. So, we know the danger of modern idolatry, but for some reason, it doesn't grab our minds and our hearts. I mean, believers, we don't think much about idols. Why is this? Well, here's what I think. We don't understand running away from God and the part our idols play in this dangerous condition. And we don't understand the consequences either. Those 
who cling to worthless idols forfeit the mercy that was theirs. Now, Jonah was running from God. I mean, this is made perfectly clear to us. A literal translation of the Hebrew makes it even more clear what was going on in Jonah. He was running from the face of God. The face of God. Not the idea of God. Not even the will of God. He was running from the face of God. This was personal. He was running from God himself. This was about a relationship Jonah did not want to pursue anymore. A relationship he did not want to pursue him. He did not want a relationship with God to take him somewhere he was unwilling to go. But in running away from God... He was running toward an idol. In this case, the the distant, exotic, pagan port of Tarshish. As far away from God's face as you can get. And that's the thing we miss, I believe. When we run away from God, we are running toward something else. And there is no middle ground. We are always running, either toward God or toward our idols. And so so here is a hard question to pose to you, to myself. Are you, am I, running towards God, God's face right now? or away from Him. I mean, there are only two options. There is no middle ground. I'm not exactly running from God, you might say. And that's how I often put it. I'm not exactly pursuing Him these days, but I'm not running away from Him either. And when I think this way, I'm ignoring the power of idols in my life. They divert my heart from God without calling any attention to themselves. I'm hardly aware of it. And yet, I am either running toward God's face or toward those things that promise me what God alone can offer. Now, the big ones, the big ones are easy to spot. (laughs) Kansas Jayhawk basketball. (laughs) I mean, after a bitter loss, I have been known to have to walk around the block several times before I'll allow anyone to even talk to me. There's something very strange going on in me when my world is upset after a group of college boys I don't even know lose a game. (laughs) A game. (laughs) That's an idol that's easy to spot. (laughs) But our most dangerous idols are the ones we hold closest to our vests. The ones we look to for our sense of identity, our sense of well-being, our sense of control. The ones we try to reframe in our hearts as righteous, or at least neutral. So it takes courage, doesn't it? It takes courage to name our idols, to examine and own the things we run toward when we're running away from God's face. But the lure of our idols is strong. 
And because, because pursuing, pursuing idols instead of pursuing God is often such a private thing in our lives, no one is challenging us about it on any kind of regular basis. Who, who was Jonah talking to? He was talking to himself. Everyone else in the story turned to God. Only Jonah was running away from the face of God. And again, at least in the prayer, he understood the consequences, forfeiting the mercy that was his. See, that's the bargain we make with our idols. We take the momentary comfort, the momentary rush of autonomy, the momentary relief they seem to offer, but we're not always aware what we trade away. The mercy of God, the grace of God, the, the love of God that is ours, if we'll have it. Now again, this is not about salvation. This is about the face of God and its impact on our lives. His mercy, His love, His grace. In the moment of clarity, in this prayer, this prayer that was either what Jonah should have prayed or what he came later to pray, Jonah sees the bargain for what it is. A fool's bargain. Now there's a third possibility, it would seem, for why the author placed Jonah's prayer in chapter 2 with Jonah in the belly of a great fish. Here it is. Jonah actually did pray this beautiful prayer at this moment in the story. I mean, he had time to craft a psalm like this. There's just not that much to do in a fish's belly. <laughs> I mean, this is such an honest prayer. And it puts its finger exactly on the problem Jonah was facing as he experienced the storm the consequences of his declaration of independence from God. God's severe mercy. I mean, the storm did cause Jonah to wake up. It did cause him to grow up. It did cause him to look up. Salvation does come from the Lord, and he, he knew it. When he prayed this prayer in the belly of the fish, he was being earnest now, maybe we can give him credit for that. <laughs> but like we so often do, he forgot about his prayer once the danger was over. Back to business as usual. He forgot about the power of his idols over him. In this case, his self-righteous sense of superiority over the people of Nineveh. There is nothing neutral about our idols. They lure us. They seduce us. They flatter us into turning from the gracious, merciful face of God and to run toward the false comfort they promise. And in the bargain, we lose what we crave the most the grace of God's presence, the love of God, the mercy of God that is ours if we'll have it. So let's pray together. Gracious God, give us clarity to identify the idols we cherish in your place and the courage to see them for what they are, worthless. Give us courage to name them, to confront them, and abandon them daily. And fill us with your Spirit 
that we might run toward your face and your mercy only. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.